Welcome to In Tune with Reality, the stories behind the music. Episode 7. Jihoon Kim shares his experience as a freshman at the Schwab School of Music. Hi everyone, welcome back to In Tune with Reality, the stories behind the music. And today we are sharing with Jihoon Kim, who is a cellist and recently one of the students admitted at the Schwab School of Music, who became an artist ambassador of the Vargas Foundation. So hi. Jihun. Hey, how are you doing, Samuel Vargas? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. Well, thank you. Congratulations on your acceptance into college. For your music you know degree and could you share with us what inspired you to pursue music at the college level yeah so i come from a musical family my mom is an amateur pianist she plays for the local church that we go to and my cousin who is also a cellist actually studied with all the great professors in college um and i didn't know about that till maybe my second or third year into playing and The reason why I got into music was because my teacher, who was really into different types of instruments when I was in fifth grade, and he was also telling me, you know, his son was into, into music, and he was telling me about the violin. And, you know, as a fifth grade, I had no idea what that was. Um, and when middle school started, my sixth grade year, we had these little times where we could go to these booths, and we went to the orchestra booth. And my orchestra teacher in middle school, her name was Miss McClellan. And um, she was teaching me about the viola. And I thought the viola and the violin were the same thing, so I had no idea. And I decided to stay with viola because my nephew actually told me that, you know, the viola was, like, never chosen. Um, and because of that, I, I chose the viola because I thought I could really do something with it. And in eighth grade, I switched to the cello. Um, and actually, the reason I switched to the cello was because there's a video on YouTube where... Um, a musician named David Aaron Carpenter was playing a Stradivarius viola and he was playing the cello suite, uh, the third one in C major. And I absolutely fell in love with it. And I couldn't believe how good the cello sounded when I heard it on YouTube for the first time. So I asked my dad to, you know, if we could rent a cello for fun. And we went to the local violin shop and we got my first cello. And I learned the beginning of the piece in like one week and I couldn't believe it. So that's how I got into music. And The story for me going to college was I actually was planning on doing psychology as my major because I loved the idea of understanding the human brain. Um, I also wanted to be a therapist because I was in therapy for a little while and I just thought it was the nicest thing because you could, you know, express your feelings, your mind, and you didn't have to really feel scared. And then I decided to go into music after all that because friends of mine told me there isn't a lot of jobs that are really good paying in psychology. So I stuck with cello. So, yeah. <laughs> nice. So now that you are in college, um, what are specific at aspects of music, whether it's a particular genre, style, are you most passionate about and eager to explore further in your studies? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, well, because I'm a cellist, I love broad music, especially with J.S. Bach and his six cello suites. I really love Baroque music, one, because the different fields of tuning, which I really got interested in when I first got into my senior year, I heard a viola professor from the, I think the New England Territory, they were playing the cello suite number two in Baroque tuning. And it just, it, to me, it just sounded so heavenly when I heard that D string at such a different pitch. And I went home and tried it out and I was like, man, this is such a different thing. I felt kind of illegal doing it because like I've never done something like that. <laughs> and, you know, with Bach, I've always just, I used to play Bach every day just in the morning because I just thought, you know, I need to warm up. But at the same time, I wanted to warm up something fun. And I always played Bach in the morning. And I also loved um, Vivaldi because that's the first thing I ever heard when I was a kid. I heard the Four Seasons. And another thing I really learned was classical music. And I also love romantic music because Brahms, Tchaikovsky Violin Concerto, and also congratulations on your performance last night. It was beautiful. And um, I really loved how Brahms wrote this beautiful cello solo 
in the symphony that he wrote that is in a lot of orchestra excerpts. I also love his sonatas. I also love his beautiful symphonies that he wrote. And yeah, so I think cello is great for romantic, baroque, classical. And now that I'm, you know, in college, I've been asked to do contemporary music, which I haven't exactly felt comfortable with yet because my rhythms can be sometimes interesting with contemporary music. So, yeah. <laughs> Fun. So we all know that that college can be a significant transition, especially when you just finished high school and now mm -hmm. you are at the university. So how are you preparing yourselves for, for the academic and artistic challenges that um, come with your majoring in music? Yeah. So with the academic part, I'm pretty used to it because high school, you know, it's, it's a requirement to take all these classes to graduate. Um, with music, it's a little different because, you know, every day I'm here, it's music related. I, you know, I have to wake up, get ready, get breakfast and start practicing because, you know, with everything that's going on, I recently, recently got into the Columbus Symphony, which was a really big uh, surprise for me. You know, it requires a lot of practice because you have to learn all this music and two to three days. Um, also, the fact that I have to do, you know, these concertos, I have to also learn the Tchaikovsky Piano Trio and the Mendelssohn Piano Trio with you and our pianist, Jung Min, which is awesome. Um, and the fact that, you know, even though it can be sometimes overwhelming with all the music that I have to learn, it sometimes feels nice to understand that, like, I will use this music in the future. And learning it now is a great feeling because it's kind of like, The first time you try something, you might not like it. Then over time, you, you just you always have it. And it's great. Um, and one other thing is, I have a lot of great friends here, um, and they've been very supportive, especially with you. Um, you've taught me a lot in just only the first two months I've been here. And you know, the violin studio, the viola studio, cello studio—they're all great people. And you know, it's easy to get along with everyone because everyone here has an open mindset about everything. Um, and it's surprising how easy it is to, you know, adjust your life to music. So nice. So now that you are two months into school, are there any particular music professors or courses at the college that you are especially excited to be learning from? Yeah. So, you know, my teacher, uh, Professor Warner, she's amazing. Um, you know, when I first heard on YouTube, I was just like, holy crap. I did not know Cho could sound that good. Um, another thing I'm really excited to do finally is music theory, music skills, even though it's not a quote unquote fun class, it's important because it'll help me over time understand how the music is written, how it's built. Um, I'm also pretty excited to learn the idea of playing for other people, especially in studio class. And, you know, in high school, we never did anything like this. It was just, you know, orchestra music and this and that. And now that I'm finally here, I'm really excited to, you know, come out of my book and really understand what it's like to be nervous, but also have support because in studio class, you know, I'm always nervous to play for it. But at the same time, I know everyone here. They're very supportive. They give me good ideas on how to change something or, you know, even make it better. And I've always been that one kid that, you know, always loves to be with, you know, be with everyone. So I actually, I go to the violin studio a lot, which I know it's not convenient because I'm not a violinist, but I learn a lot because, you know, the violin professor here is Sergio Schwartz. Professor Schwartz is an awesome guy. He is, you know, very interested. And I, also he is like me because I'm really into violin making. I'm into all the fancy violin books and the makers of bows, cellos, violins. And the funny thing about Professor Schwartz is he always plays violins right before your lesson, which is the funny part. And I always get interested because he asks me these questions like, which but was better for this and that. Um, you know, he's also very nice. He is opening to me, um, Sanford Warner. Another thing I'm really, really excited for is chamber music. I never really did a lot of chamber music. Um, I was in this one program called Franklin Pond Chamber Music where they did something like this, but it wasn't as big as it is in college. So I'm really excited for that. Sounds cool. So you mentioned that you are playing in various ensembles at school. So can you tell us about any upcoming musical projects or groups you are looking forward to being a part of? Yeah. So, for example, our group, the Tchaikovsky Trio, um, a.k.a. the Atlas Trio, which is awesome. I'm really excited for this because actually we're planning on doing the MTNA competition soon. Um, I'm also really excited to learn these pieces because 
they're such big works and it's i've been told that the tchaikovsky trio has not been played at Shuo for or, over a decade um and the mendelssohn trio is also another great piece that i love because it has this beautiful cello opening and you know i've heard i heard this piece when i was in high school and i just thought it was the greatest awesomest piece i've ever heard another thing i'm excited for is the columbus symphony because this will be the first time i'm ever in a, a professional setting where i'm expected to learn the music without you know being that one kid that just sight reads the first rehearsal <laughs> and you know it's it's an awesome experience because even though i'm only 18 i feel like i'm already working in the professional area because all these people that ask me to do things i feel like i'm obligated to do the work and i'm grateful that i'm getting the opportunities to get these chances because you know as an 18 year old and especially in music school all the bigger older students get the opportunities because they're much more skilled so i think especially at schwo even though it's a sc small school it feels like i'm in a big community which is really nice so you know when i was doing my my bachelor's coming from a different country who has spoke a different language mm -hmm. it was very hard to do that transition um trying to adapt not just to a different culture a mm -hmm. different language but also all of these academic classes and courses I had to take. Mm -hmm. um, so how do you manage to balance your music studies, all your practice sessions, your rehearsals with the academics, like knowing that you have to take American government, um, history, as uh, since 19, whatever, or since <laughs> 14, whatever. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in, environmental science, all of these things that we have the math and biology. So how do you how do you balance these two things? Yeah, well, I've actually recently been using Google Calendar for all my things, and it's it's hard to make sure I'm up to date because sometimes I can feel lazy, and sometimes I might forget to add something. But I've been you know I've been told that if you ever get double booked, it's a really bad thing to happen, especially in the professional area. Um, with practicing, you know, since I'm only a freshman, I'm not too too busy. So I get the chance to, you know, practice, relax, and also watch these videos. For example, these cello master classes, and especially the concert we had last night, I get to watch that live streamed. Um, with concerts and performances and all the other things, I've been always that kind of kid who really wants to be ahead of, like one step ahead. Um, like rehearsals, I always come 30 minutes before. I'll see the percussion section setting up the room. I'll see David, uh, setting up the room sometimes um, and also with uh, managing my time and balancing out my life it's not too complicated because I live so close to the school so I can just walk to school and get a coffee so it's not too bad um, and the fact that my roommate is also awesome guy also has a similar schedule that I do so it I can always leave the rooms leave the house the same time as he does so I always feel like I'm not forgetting anything so yeah so do you have um, any like short term goals and long term goals? I know you just spoke about being in Columbus Symphony, you're playing chamber music, doing all of these performances and taking all of these classes. But how do you envision, how do you see yourself after you graduate? What do you see yourself doing? Well, that's a good question. That's because I, f I say it's a good question because it's something that is hard to think about because it's in the future. But right now, I would love to be a chamber musician, also an orchestral music musician and a soloist. Um, I absolutely love the idea of playing, you know, around the world like you do. Um, I also love playing orchestra music because, you know, it's like you get to work with your colleagues, you get to be best friends. Um, chamber music is something that I was not familiar with until now because you know, you have to rely on yourself. You can't rely on someone else to pick up your mess. Um, and one thing that's really exciting about chamber music is, you know, you can be funny sometimes because you're the only one playing that part. And I know sometimes when I've seen all these old recordings, you can see people doing different techniques, different vibratos. And sometimes I feel like I could do the same, but I want to be myself when I do that. So what I do is normally I ask questions in the group. Sometimes I ask people, why would you do this? Or what would you do here? And to me, it's it's important that I ask questions because, you know, as a kid, I've always been scared to ask questions because I thought it'd be like, you know, if I asked a question, that means I'm stupid or I don't understand this. But 
being in college, asking questions is like your best friend. You know, I was afraid of asking, like, for example, my teacher, uh, how do you do this fingering? I thought I'd have to learn the fingering myself. And, you know, with being with you, especially, you know, you're, you've learned so much being in college. And now that you have such a successful career, I feel like asking questions isn't even like a fun thing. It's like a luxury because like you have such a high level of playing now that I feel so lucky to ask you stuff because first of all, you know, you have done all these things, these awesome performances, concerts, recitals, and you're always, you know, only 10 minutes away from me. So I can ask you fun questions like, why would you do that? Um, so yeah, I you know one thing I also realize is with music, it's not like a strict thing. It's like, you can be open about it. You can have different ideas. So I feel like being in college, I feel happy, you know, because I, I could be myself. So, you know, that's, what's a really good thing about it. So, well, I also think that by being here at Schwab, um, because of the structure, the location, all of the things that integrate the, the institution is like the perfect place for, for music students to cultivate themselves, to study, to practice, because there are no distractions. This is not a big city. It's mm -hmm. actually a town mm -hmm. in Columbus, Georgia. Um, you know, there is no like nightlife. It's not like being mm -hmm. in New York when you walk to the streets and then you see Times Square and then you are <laughs> just like, okay, this is way more fun than mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> the life at the dorm. Um, <laughs> yeah. So I think that is, it's also amazing for, for me um, to see how every generation that comes to school is greater than, than the one before. Mm -hmm. And you in particular are someone who is very open, who has an open heart for all of these things, for, for music, for new experiences. You are constantly asking questions mm -hmm. and, and questioning yourself, your own playing, your own voice, your own fingerings. And I think that that's really the way to go because and there will be a, a point in your career um, where actually going to the lesson to expect the teacher to guide you and to work with you and what you have to do will not longer be a thing. Mm -hmm, yeah, you will have to stand on your own, and and actually, it's not because now the professor will not have anything to teach you. It's because now you have already outgrown that process. You already got your bachelor, you already got mm -hmm. your master's, you already got your degree. So now you have a criteria that you have built um, from your experience at college to be able to 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 have the resources mm -hmm, to exactly. build yourself. But it's easier. And it's more effective when you gather all of those resources and start applying them from the beginning. Exactly. So don't wait until you get all your degrees to stand on your own. Stand on your on your own from now. Mm -hmm. So that when you come to a lesson and if you have your own finger and your own boy, you have something to say. Exactly. So that yeah. the teacher goes like, okay. Okay, so I am seeing some personalities, some <laughs> some own ideas. Mm -hmm. You know, so that's that's super inspiring. And I think that you are you are doing an amazing job by just being here for, for, you know, two months. And I also want everyone to know that you started cello when you were 15, right? Yep. Oh, no, I started cello, I'd say 13 and a half to 14. 13? Okay. In eighth grade, yeah. So, and you are 18 now. So, you have only been playing that four instrument half, for four years. and a half, five years. Yeah. And that's really impressive. That's really amazing. Mm -hmm. Now you are playing, you know, the greatest pieces of Tchaikovsky Rococo and mm -hmm. the Tchaikovsky Trio and <laughs> the Bach suites for cello mm -hmm. in like original tuning and yeah. all of that. So that's really awesome. And and that's why I want to ask you about something that I'm very big, <clears throat> um, a, a big advocate, which is like personal growth. Mm -hmm. How do you see all of these experiences nurturing and in supporting your personal growth because yes you can become an extraordinary musician but what about the person behind the instrument what about the person behind the music yeah it's a great question um well as a kid i used to be the class clown i used to love always you know bringing energy to the table um with music you know of course you have to be professional mature about certain things but at the same time you know you can also be a lot of fun because 
music making is not only about just being professional, it's also about enjoying and being happy around the people you play with. Um, you know, sometimes you and I and our pianists, we can just joke around when we play in rehearsal, which is awesome. Um, and sometimes, you know, I always have to remember that in certain situations, I have to really be professional about something because, you know, I've been told if you do this or that and you make a mistake, sometimes you'll get it, you know, you'll have a warning, but sometimes you can get fired. And, you know, as for personal growth, um, I feel like the older I get, the more experiences I learn. I feel like I know how to adapt myself into that world because, you know, especially with music in high school, you know, in high school, you get used to playing with friends and gaming and this and that. But in music, you know, you have to always make sure you prepare everything. You know, you're not falling behind. You are one step ahead. Um, and I also, you know, I love being here because a lot of people here are very friendly, very happy. Um, and especially with you and me, like we have such similar personalities where we always love being everywhere, exploring and doing this and that. And, you know, another thing I really enjoy about my personal growth here is I get to understand how everyone works. You know, some people here are a little more strict than others. Some people here are really open, really friendly. And I'm trying to adapt myself to being the perfect person for myself where I'm not too crazy, but I'm also not too strict or, you know, being aggressive in my, to my own self. Because sometimes, you know, when I play something, I feel like, if I made a mistake, why did I make that mistake? You know, sometimes like when I make a recording for an audition, I'm like, that part just sucked. That was horrible. It was out of tune. But sometimes, you know, your colleagues might listen to it and they say, you know, that wasn't as bad as you think, Jay. You know, it's, it's been, it's been pretty good. Um, and you know, for personal growth, I think I can also learn to be myself by learning from other people. I think that in the little you know, time that I have been knowing you and spending with you. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I notice, especially because of my back background in neuroscience and neurolinguistics and my mom being a psychiatrist and all of that, mm -hmm. is that you are a very sane kid. Mm -hmm. You act of your age, yes. Mm -hmm. You are very mature in many ways, but because of your personality and the awareness that you have of the things that are surrounding you, mm -hmm you preserve the integrity of someone that knows what he wants, um, where you are going, um, without letting these, you know, hard situations or challenge challenges to like set you back. Yeah. Or, you know, make you go like, okay, I can't do this or I I I am not good at it. Or, mm -hmm. you know, I sound like I will never make it or anything. So because <clears throat> of that can you share a little bit your perspective um, on how do you stay motivated? How do you keep yourself um, accountable? Mm -hmm. um, well, the motivation really comes from the people I'm around. I'm one of those people that, you know, gains other people's energy. So I love the fact that people here are very dedicated to their work. You know, sometimes, and I shouldn't do this too often, but I go to you know, a close friend of mine's practice room to hear them play. Um, sometimes I also realize how good some people are here. You know, I understand like some people aren't talented, but they practice so much that the talent is like hidden, but you can also feel that the amount of practice they've done has really shown their talent. Um, sometimes I also realize where if I feel like I'm not at the same level as certain people, I feel like that is a good thing because it helps me want to get even better than them. You know, I've been told, you know, at music schools, if you go to the super big ones like Juilliard, Curtis, you'll really have to, you know, work your ass off. And I feel like, and I shouldn't curse, but I feel like it is really difficult because, you know, with music, everyone is different technique wise and, you know, musicality wise and the way people think. But at the same time, I feel like I could really understand the motivation that comes from the person because first of all, competitions auditions, um, trying to be your best. It all comes to play, but at the same time, you really just, you really want to be your best. And with me, I love trying to, you know, have fun with people, but at the same time, I want to make sure I'm never behind anyone. Um, I don't practice six hours a day, but I do practice and I try to practice as smart as I can because, you know, I, I do get, you know, fatigued sometimes from playing too much because, 
you know, when, when I play too much music, it's just like, you've played it so many times and eventually your brain just gets tired of it. So what I do is, you know, I try to always make sure if there's a certain thing I have to learn by a certain time, I will focus on that specifically. For example, CSO, I will make sure I learn the music at least one day before the rehearsals because I don't want to feel like that one kid because I'm the youngest. I have to be that stereotype where because he's the youngest, he won't know what he's doing. Um, and, you know, because of that, I want to make people think of the opposite when they see me. Like, I want to think, oh, you know, Jihoon is 18 years old, but he acts and, you know, he prepares like a professional. And obviously that's not easy to do because you have to really work hard. And, you know, with being here and having so much time in school, it helps. Um, and being with people around me, like, for example, you, the violin studio, the cello studio, you know, you guys are all my best friends, but at the same time, I feel like I have to really be at the same level as you guys to really feel happy because if I feel like I'm that one kid that can't play music well, but I'm still trying to be the same, you know, level mentally, I feel like I'm not being honest to myself. Um, and also I really do like practicing and the motivation does come from seeing other people. Like for example, when we do our trio, I feel like I can't be that one guy because especially with three people, I feel like I have to really bring my, my level to even higher than you guys, because when we all play together, we all learn from each other. So that is one important thing for me. So, yeah. What do you think that has been the biggest challenge you have encountered so far at school? Um, I think it's the l workload. I, as a freshman, you know, I didn't expect myself to have so much opportunity, but at the same time, I feel like I put too much on my plate. Um, you know, for example, I've had, Some people ask me to join their chamber groups and I've had to say no because it's just too much work. Um, and with CSO coming in now, I know I feel like I have to work double hard because with, you know, the Philharmonic at Schwab, that's already difficult enough with the music. And now that I have CSO, I have all these chamber competitions with the trio. I also have to learn, you know, solo repertoire and I have to prepare for all these, you know, concerts, gigs and everything that I feel like the biggest thing that's been on my mind is, you know, making sure I get everything done, everything ready. Because, you know, with so much music, you know, with limited time, you know, it's really hard to balance out what music you have to do because some days there might be a thing where you have a gig this day and you also have a concert that day. And you feel like you don't know what to do because you're technically double booked with music. You know, you have to learn this and this and both the music could be difficult. So that's been the hardest thing for me. And the way I've been avoiding you know, trying to like explode my brain is I've been listening to a lot of the music. I've been also spreading my time wisely, especially with, you know, CSO and the Schwab. I've been learning, you know, some days I'll do one hour of practice for CSO, one hour for Schwab, and then maybe I'll do 30 minutes for solo music. And if it's something that's not too important, I'll put it away for maybe a day or two. But for anything that's like upcoming, I will make sure I practice that mostly. How, how do you, now that you're saying something that is not maybe too important, how do you prioritize these things? Is it uh, based on what is in a closer date? Um, what is the hardest? Mm -hmm. How do you decide what gets your attention for the amount of time that you practice? Well, yeah, so time of date. Um, for example, if I have a concert in one week, I got to make sure that concert is my number one priority because it is a concert. Um, for the least important things, I put those categories for things like solo rep that I'm not playing for a while. Like, for example, if I'm doing Tchaikovsky Rococo, if I'm not playing it for another four or five months and I feel like it's at a good level, I will put it away for now because I know I can learn it. Um, for music that is important, like, you know, concerts, I mainly, it depends on the music because, well, I shouldn't say this, but if I'm sitting in the far, far back, And I'm not expected to lead or to have the number one top, top shape of playing. I will sometimes, you know, focus on the music that where, for example, if I'm sitting assistant principal, I'll work on that a lot because, you know, I'm expected to learn the music. And if I have to lead sometimes because the principal sometimes forgets, you know, that's something I have to remember to make sure I'm ready for. Um, because, you know, in music and especially in orchestra, You know, being principal or assistant principal in the section, you know, you have different roles. You know, you have to 
you have to be respected. You have to respect people. You have to make sure you know the music, but also at the same time, you have to make sure that you're being yourself. Because I know some people who are in music think, because I know this better than this person, I'm a better musician than them. You know, especially in high school, I've had to deal with people that have had egos, especially in music, which is, you know, it's pretty common to see in like small places because you think you're the best in that area. Um, at the same time, I always make sure I, I want to be that one person that, you know, everyone understands is trying to be fair, trying to be open and wants to respect everyone. So I also, you know, I make sure that I am being myself, especially with music that has a lot of work to be done. So, you know, I'll make sure I'm ready for it. Okay. Nice. I think that you are very advanced in the way that you think about all of these things. Um, because a lot of students that haven't had um, the experiences and opportunities that you have gone through come to a school um, realizing that there is a huge truck coming their way at 200 miles per hour. Mm -hmm. And they are not ready for this. Yeah. And the impact crashes them. Mm -hmm. So then you see students often struggling because they cannot fulfill the expectations or every single one of the things they do at school at the same level. So I think that in that matter, you are very, very aware of the things that you are capable of doing mm -hmm. and, and what are the things that require um, more attention. And, you know, when, when we are growing up, like, for example, for me, um, since I was little and, and I grew up in El Sistema program, um, you know, uh, I didn't have a lot of access to Internet or a cell phone until I was already a late teenager. Mm -hmm. So for me, when I discovered what the Internet was around the age of like 14, 15, mm -hmm. and I am nine years older than you. It was like a life changer. It was like, wow, now I can hear people on YouTube. What is <laughs> YouTube, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and my role model, the, the person that I admire the most, um, and I fall in love with her, is Janine, Janine Janssen. Mm -hmm. And I saw her recordings playing Brooke Valin Concerto, Mendelssohn Valin Concerto, The Proms, um, from like 2006 or something. I don't even know <laughs> what, what year. Um, and for me to see her play with such a personality and character was like, wow. You know, <laughs> she, I always joke about it because I say she's my wife, but she doesn't know it. So I want to ask you, who have been your role model um, during your journey? Like, who do you look up to? Like from that big, great, you know, yeah. concert artist. So I look up to a lot of people that are, you know, my level almost in terms of age. Um, a lot of soloists that are like in their 20s, for example, you, you know, I really look up to because, you know, you were literally in my position only a few years ago, you know. Um, for the big names, you know, I really look up to Yo-Yo Ma, not only because his playing is amazing, but because he is so fascinated by like cultures and everything. And I'm not fully into that as a person, but I am really interested in learning about the different ways people do music. Um, for cello playing, specifically the playing itself, I really love to listen to Johannes Moser, um, Alvin Gerhardt. They're both great players. I love them because they really respect the composer's words. Um, I know some people that just play the music because it's easy. They want to learn the notes. But I also love those two players because they play the music based on what the composer actually wrote. Um, like, for example, tempos. You know, some people play the Shostakovich cello concerto really slow, but the actual tempo is actually pretty fast. So it's not as slow as what people think. Um, and other people that I really look up to nowadays, you know, like a lot of YouTube videos that I watch are Sterling Elliott. I watch Elisa Watherstein. Um, and I even watch you because, you know, you're such a, not even a great player. You're like such a deep and motivational player, especially when I see you play, like for example, last night, it, I felt so much goosebumps when I heard you play because it's just, you felt like yourself on stage. Um, and another thing I really, 
you know, I really look up to is people that are great teachers and not just players, for example. Um, the professor at NEC recently came to show up. Her name was Yisung Kim. I got to talk to her. She was really inspiring because she told me, you know, her stories about being a student at one of the professors at NEC. Um, and now that they both work together, you know, I asked them, what is it like working with your teacher? And she says, you know, we have our respected spaces, you know, different students, but I still respect him because, you know, he was my teacher. He built my foundation. He helped me start my career. And I feel like that's awesome to hear because I feel like knowing my professor, she's very, you know, intelligent, especially when it comes to connections. And I love the fact that she just loves helping her, not helping herself, but like helping the students that she teaches to know how to be themselves, you know, have their own sound, how to have their own personality, especially in the music world, because it's, you know, sometimes I can feel overwhelmed with everything, but with her, you, and all the people at Shuo, I feel like everything seems calmer, so. I think it's interesting because, you know, every time I play with you, every time I share time with you, I see you like my child. <laughs> it's funny because it's like, you have become a friend, yes. Mm -hmm. But the way that I see you and the things that you do, musically speaking and as a student, is like someone I want to be able to be there for. Mm -hmm. And of course, it's very inspiring. And, and I feel very grateful that that's the way that you look at me as, mm -hmm. a, as a player, as an artist. Um, but I also want you and everyone listening to to know and to be aware that for someone like me in my position, mm -hmm. seeing your growth, listening to your questions, being able to be challenged by the things that you bring to the conversations are also an extraordinary way for me to keep growing, for me to not fall asleep, for mm -hmm. me to keep researching, for me to keep looking for information because as you know, and you have heard all my kids and my little students uh, around the world, you know, I don't have the privilege of sharing with them in person like I do with you. Mm -hmm. So it's like all of these um, connections that we make as artists with people, sometimes we, we found those that, you know, they kind of like vibrate in the same frequency. Yeah, and I think yeah. that that's something that happened with you, not just because we have such a similar personalities and <laughs> we're a little bit crazy, but um, <laughs> I think I think it's because we have a lot of similarities in the way that we think about music mm -hmm. or in the way that we try to convey the power of music to others. Because I think that you are a very humane person. Mm -hmm. You are always trying to support others, always trying to help, always trying to, to do good things mm. that will have an impact. And I think that that's way more valuable than just playing all the notes perfect. Yeah. Because when you are that type of player, yes, congratulations. You are flawless and you have perfect technique. Mm -hmm. But the question is, what are you living as your footprint or as your unique mark for others mm -hmm. to learn from from others to remember you and i believe that through this journey that you are starting and you know i'm graduating next year so i will probably not be here and i will be leaving and you will continue your studies you will be meeting more people i will i will always be you know grateful that I was able to find, you know, someone that I could, even though it's not the same instrument, mm -hmm. you know, share all of these experiences. Yeah. And now that you are an ambassador of the organization, you know, I'm as as the president and founder, I'm, I'm just looking forward to see how the foundation can become um, that platform for mm -hmm. you to perform, for you to actually reach more people, not just through your playing, but through who you are mm -hmm. and by your personality, by your craziness and um, awesomeness so that you can, you know, <laughs> make everyone laugh like you do in our violin little gatherings and mm -hmm. things with our professor. <laughs> so I think that that's, that's going to be 
an awesome experience for you. And this is your first semester. Yeah. And there is a lot more coming for you. So that's why my last question for today's episode would be, um, if you were the age that you had when you started playing, what would you tell yourself? That is a, a spectacular question because I actually have something that I really wish I told myself. Don't be afraid of asking questions. Um, and another thing is, you know, be yourself because, you know, in middle school and high school, I always wanted to be that kid who fit in with people. Um, I've always also really wanted to be the person that, you know, really surprises people in a good way. But, you know, not everything works out the way you do. But, you know, I really wish I could tell myself, just be yourself because, you know, in middle school with, with technology and phones, you know, you really want to be like, you're the cool kid. And with actual cool kids being in your school, it's like, you feel like you're not part of that group. So you feel like you don't feel respected in the same way. But, you know, now that I'm finally in college, I'm done with high school and done with this in middle school, I feel like the opportunities that I saw were kind of blinded to me. Like, for example, when I was told by my teachers that, you know, you just practice a lot, you know, you're, you're, you're expected to do this and that. And now I'm seeing those actual words being, you know, coming to real life. And, you know, as a 13 year old, 14 year old, I would just say, you know, make sure you really don't feel committed by someone else's words and actions. Feel the way you feel, you know, trust your gut, practice the way you do. Don't feel like because this person's amazing or there's a prodigy in your school, you don't have to be like them. Be like yourself because, you know, you have your own personalities, your own mindset, your own your person has things to offer. Not that, not that everyone has. And I feel like if, if I was 13 again, I would have just tried to be myself because I just, I felt like I had to be someone else for, you know, just to be respected. But now that I'm, with you, with college and with my professor, I feel like I could be myself. And now I really see what I can bring to the table. And I, for me personally, I don't know what the results will be, but I know for a fact, because I'm myself, I'll be the most happy. That sounds great. Yeah. And I think that that's, that's very inspiring. And, and if you keep sharing that, because it's not just about saying it to a microphone for a podcast is mm-hmm. it's being able to to say these things when you feel like someone needs to hear that mm-hmm. because believe it or not one person can change someone's life it takes yeah. only one person to make the difference so i'm very happy and i'm very grateful that we had the opportunity to chat and to have this yeah. episode today and I'm looking forward to recording another episode together, a little bit less serious, mm-hmm. less um, question by question. <laughs> um, but I think that is very important um, for us to let know um, what type of people we have joined the organization as ambassadors mm-hmm. and where is that um, point of, you know, middle point where we find each other, not because you are all great talented um, musicians but also because you have a particular and unique um, personality trait it's mm-hmm. like everyone in the foundation speaks the same language when it comes to giving back yeah and helping others and supporting everyone so i think that that's awesome and you have shown that in a variety of ways not just with your playing with you volunteering with you helping with donations, but also by giving them. Mm-hmm. So uh, I, I think that that's extraordinary. And we are super, super grateful for all of those things. And we keep looking forward to see you grow and, you know, succeeding yeah. in your own career. So thank you so much. And thank yeah. you, everyone. Thanks for having me, Sam. <laughs>